Hello and welcome to um, a very special interview here on, on the Pink and Channels. I'm Paddy David, and um, and I'm delighted uh, to uh, to introduce uh, Dan Goroff. Uh, did I pronounce that right, Dan? That's close enough. That's good. <laughs> who um, who is going to uh, provide us hopefully over the next however long uh, some some real insight into Mark Atanasio um, and his work at the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, for anybody who's been living under a rock, obviously, we, 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 if you're listening to this or watching this, you'll know that Mark Atanasio is um, a, a Norwich's new or most recent uh, director appointed a minority shareholder, bought Michael Forge's shareholding and one or two other shareholdings, uh, and has subsequently, obviously, purchased uh, C preference shares up to £10 million. So, so uh, you know, really exciting development. Earlier in the year, we were the first to break that, um, and now it's all been confirmed. and and we all wait now to see how the, the relationship developed. Most recently, him and his family were at the uh, the Middlesbrough game prior to the World Cup break. Uh, he did another round of media there. And what we probably don't know so much about his story is is actually what he's done with the Brewers. He, he's been there 18 years now, took over in 2004, uh, and has turned him into a, a very, very competitive Major League Baseball outfit. This is where Dan comes in. Dan worked for 28 years with the Philadelphia Phillies, um, latterly as a director of ticketing, Dan, head of ticketing. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm going to stretch the realms of my MLB knowledge. The Phillies recently got to the World Series final where they lost to the Houston Astros, but edged out Atanasio's Brewers for that final playoff spot in the National League. And, and you were just telling me before we started recording, Dan, as well, that there's another connection between the Phillies and the Brewers um, all, not all that many years ago as well in, in terms of World Series baseball. Yeah, we were fortunate enough to uh, beat them in the 2008 playoffs and go on and win the World Series, which was uh, probably a high, certainly the highlight of my my career. And, uh, it was almost as much fun as the uh, the parade down Broad Street in front of two million people, where wow. people were waving at our employee float as if we were actually players. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> yeah, and, and you it were was, just. You were just telling me before, a little bit like uh, the Super Bowl, you get a ring. Uh, oh, we do. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to see it? If you've got it. If you've got it, Dan. <laughs> uh, just happen to have it here. Oh, there you go. Uh, Mr. Atanasio is watching. Eat your heart out. <laughs> just hold it up so we can just see it there, Dan. I well, can't I don't know. Where am I holding it up to? I don't just, know. Just sort of to the, your left, your left ear. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Wow, there that's it. a nice nice piece of jewelry. Yeah. yeah. Has Oh, has my name on it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> You can't beat that. Yeah, and as yeah, you say, so I think it's so far it, elusive for Mr. Atanasio and the Brewers, yeah. <laughs> well, look, one of the things that, you know, there's a – Major League Baseball uh, has, has a, a great sense of collegiality, and uh, we meet often with – we I should say they meet and so no longer working there – often with other teams. And one of the things that any of us who have ever won – World Series, and when we say we, including the front office, we certainly feel like we had an important role in it. Uh, we want, I think, everybody who works in the game to have the experience of, of winning a World Series. I mean, there is absolutely nothing like it. You can, uh, you can be making a, millions of dollars a year, and you can't match what it means to be in the game for as long as many of us have been, and to achieve that goal, even though. If you didn't play a minute on the field, uh, you know, we, uh, we all feel we were part of it. And I don't think there's any question that, that we were. And someday I, I wish he wins one. Exactly. Not at our expense. But uh, you just you beat me to it. You beat me to the payoff there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, I mean, I may be a Norwich fan, but I'm a Phillies fan first. Well, I mean, well, let's just touch on that as well, because it's not just um, your expert insight of, of MLB and how that will track, we'll get into it obviously in due course, but where Atanasio is coming from and what could translate. But you do actually have a um, more than a passing interest in Norwich City as well, Dan. Just give us the potted history of how you came well, to. Uh, how I, when I was a kid, I was reading a newspaper, uh, Sunday New York Times, and there was a section each week which gave the British football scores. And I eventually latched on for some reason to Norwich. Maybe they were winning some matches, I don't know, but. For, my interest lay dormant for a number of years, let's put it that way. And then through the miracle of streaming video, I was able to find a few games about 10 or 12 years ago and, and sort of rekindled my interest. And 
now subscribe to Canaries TV and, and to your periodical, what do you call it? Your your paper? Yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this, the online version, I guess. And if there's and uh, so here we are. I mean, I you know I watch all the games. I know nothing about the game. I, I'm certainly not in a position to. I don't know what a false nine is. I have a real trouble sometimes to figure out what offsides is. <laughs> but I, I know all the players' faces, and I'm uh, certainly happy to see that you got at least, what, two Americans playing? Well, yeah, one one notable one, yeah, Mr. Sargent, currently yeah. in Qatar with uh, your boys, yeah. Yeah, and I think there's, an, uh, there's another one, too. Who's, young Tom, yeah, sorry, John from Tompkinson, yeah, young yeah, defender. Yeah, I think so. Well, I'm not, I don't consider myself a... Uh, xenophobe by any means but but it's nice to see them play and, and uh you know i'll be watching tomorrow morning i guess it's here i don't normally watch american football they're, they're soccer yeah. football i watch soccer i don't watch we have a team in philadelphia and it's done pretty well in their league but i confess i haven't watched much of their games but i do like norwich and uh i certainly hope that this relationship uh, is a successful one yeah, I mean, we're, we'll just stress we're recording here just uh, ahead of the US's last 16 game oh. against the Netherlands. Yeah, but yes, uh, right. yeah. what we will do, we'll get into it now then. And, and, and I will stress again that, you know, you don't ha obviously personally have any uh, relationship with, with Atanasio. Never but, met him. No. no. But what, what I think you can bring for our audiences certainly is somebody who's worked at a senior level within that organization, within an organization of an MLB club. Um, and I think looking in terms of, you know, he came in in 2004, I think you, you said you retired around about 20, 2015. So you'd, you'd have almost seen from the inside of the sport, the first 10 or 11 years of what was happening at the Brewers off the field and on the field, the commercial elements, and then maybe latterly from, from a distance. So if, I, if we start, I mean, how would you assess how the Brewers have grown as an organisation in that period? And what does that maybe say about Atanasio as a type of owner? And, and maybe how is he viewed within MLB by other organisations? Well, I think I think a little historical context is probably uh, necessary. He bought the team in 2004. Uh, in 2001, the Selig family, who owned the team before him, and uh, Bud Selig, who was the original owner, was elected commissioner of baseball by the other owners. So he kind of turned the team over to his daughter and son-in-law, who I have met on a few occasions. Uh, and they were building a new ballpark, as almost every major league team was in those days, to bring it up to date to enter the 21st century, essentially. I mean, there was a lot of things that had to be improved on the baseball side, the physical training side, the, the fitness side, the... Uh, 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 the ability to sell luxury suites, the ability to improve the concession area, to have a huge parking lot, and so on. All those things happened in 2001. And what they did, they made an important decision, which was a real game changer. And I think maybe the reason why he decided to buy the team. Wisconsin, which is where Milwaukee is, is a bit, it can be bitterly cold in the wintertime. Uh, and the baseball season, which starts in April, uh, there's often snow on the ground. It's, it, it could be freezing. That It's very inhospitable to players and fans. They decided to spend a good bit of money building a retractable roof on the ballpark, which took the weather element completely out of play and which allowed for fans to watch the game comfortably in shirt sleeves, in fact, if they wanted to, in the in the middle of a snowstorm, if there was one outside, and because the roof was uh, was closed, they could play a game and not have to suffer through rainouts, which is sort of the bane of of the of, of ticket people in baseball. Anyway, I can tell you that. But they were a miserable team in terms of winning and losing in the entire decade of the '90s. I think they lost. When I say they had a losing record, there's 162 games se season, 81 home, 81 away uh, from the beginning of April to the end of September, and if you're lucky enough to be in the playoffs into October. Uh, and they uh, lost more games than they won for, I think, 11 consecutive years. Then they built a stadium. 
As a result of the excitement of the new stadium, their attendance increased in 2001 from something like 15,000 people a game. I think it was a million point, well, I should say a million point one point five, a million, million five hundred thousand, which is a very low number and unsustainable in terms of trying to be competitive. And they increased that the first year of the park to about 2.8 million and a million three hundred thousand. If you say it was an average of $30, uh, you're talking about a, a ticket, you're talking about a, an increase of, what, $45 million or so, just in ticket revenue alone, not to mention concessions and so on. Nonetheless, the team did miserably in that year, and the following year, attendance dropped the way it often does in, the new, in these new parks when the enthusiasm lasts for a year and then the team performance determines whether you can continue to, you, excuse me, continue to sell tickets. And the next two years, in 2002, was a, the worst year in their history. They lost, there were 50 games under 500. And that's probably around the time that he got involved in negotiating. I don't know how long it takes to to seal a deal. But once he took over, and I think it had something to do with the prior administration, they started winning again. I think it had to do with some player development issues, which are a little too complicated to get into now, which allowed them to have players that were going to have a great impact on the, uh, on the performance in the field. And when he took over, I think the year after, maybe two years after, they started winning. By winning, I mean they started having a record of over 500. And from that year on until the present, with a few exceptions, they won consistently. They had a few bad years in there, a few years under 500. They, they won, they would average maybe 85, 86 wins a couple of years. They were up in the high 90s. And in baseball, unlike, you know, say, pr Premier League, when teams run away and win 15 matches in a row, if you win 60% of your games, you're doing really well, and you're probably going to go far in the playoffs. And they hit that level two or three times and did very well and continue to do well. Uh, and given the fact that Milwaukee is a town with not many more people than Norwich, from what I understand, I think it has like 800,000 people, something like that. And they are, they, their state is a rural state. You probably don't have to go too far outside of town to hit nothing but farmland. There are probably more cows than people in within a hundred miles of, you know, once the farms begin. So they don't have a large, what I would call geographic uh, fan base imprint. And yet they've been selling in the last 15 years, they've been averaging over 2.5 million people a year. They've reached 3 million, which is really the gold standard. I mean, they used to give us awards in our annual meetings if, you're, if your team sold 3 million tickets. It is a real achievement. And to do it in that environment with so few people and not, you know, people having to drive far and wide to come with their recreational vehicles and camp in the parking lot to see three games over a weekend I mean, that's how they had to attract fans, and they did an incredible job. And at some point, I think you have to say, okay, the prior administration helped turn things around, particularly by building this beautiful park, and it really is nice. I've been there. But then you have to start giving credit to the new administration. Now, what I don't know is who in the old regime stayed on and worked in you know, in in vice presidential directorships or whatever, whatever capacity, or whether he brought his own people in, or there was a gradual changing of the guard. Regardless, from the time he took over, the performance both on the field and at the box office, which are interrelated. I mean, you generally can't have one without the other. You can't sustain a winning record unless you generate the revenue when you're talking about now a hundred million dollars a year in ticket revenue for if you're selling 35,000 tickets a, a game 
And since they have protection from the weather, they don't lose any games from rainouts. So I mean, these are, uh, this is a remarkable achievement. It's remarkable in any environment, but particularly in the what we call a small market environment that Milwaukee is in. And it's very similar to the situation Norwich is in. So without knowing what his actual role is in any of this, is whether he was a, an owner who was a hands-off owner and let he hired good people and let them do their job, uh, which I happen to think is the best approach, or whether he was hands-on and made the decisions that led to the success of the organization. Ultimately, he deserves the credit one way or the other for what happened. And I, I, you know, I, I heard a couple of his interviews. I think he's pretty proud of it. He made he made the pointed reference to the fact that uh, essentially he he enjoyed beating the big guys at their own game. I mean, there are teams that have an awful lot more money who can afford to pay a lot more to free agents. There's no guarantee that those people are going to perform any better just because they have higher salary. Uh, they've done remarkably well. And uh, uh, their payroll has always been in the lower third of Major League Baseball, as far as I can tell. I know had a major jump this past year, but I have to think I have probably has to do with the uh, situation the players were in that they wanted to lock them up before they moved on to another team. Uh, but so I would say that there's a great deal of uh, respect for the Brewers throughout baseball. Uh, as a person who was in the ticket world for my entire career, it certainly has my respect for what the, the ticketing situation was. And I know that's a, that's a organizational-wide activity. I mean, everybody's involved in, in bringing fans in. The players are the most important part. They always are. Uh, and they've done a great job. They weren't very far away the last couple of years from from making the playoffs and per, possibly going far into the playoffs. And it could very well be back in a, in the mix again next year. But one thing he's pretty sure is they're going to draw a lot of fans, and those fans are going to buy a lot of beer, and those and they're going to eat a lot of bratwurst sandwiches, and they're going to do whatever it is to to uh, to fill the coffers. Yeah, and they're yeah. gonna and they're gonna park in their twelve thousand uh, car parking lot at fifteen to twenty five dollars a pop. So you know uh, there's a lot of revenue that can be generated by a successful franchise, and they're clearly a very successful franchise. And that's that's a great point to jump on to because obviously a lot of this at the minute in terms of his impact on Norwich or what he's looking to do will, will have to be by definition hypothetical. We're still in the early phase of that and, and we'll get into the revenue aspect and particularly as you say what they can do in and around the stadium whether that is the commercial match day experience or or maybe even ground expansion but just to backtrack one stage and again you know looking at it from you know a distance a uh, degree of detachment but why do you think Norwich is it that and you've already touched on this it feels like a very similar market in terms of the scale of the smaller clubs um that that aspect of the challenge that appealed to him because in that last round of interviews recently he said he looked at English football clubs for the last 10 years but I think his quote was along the lines of Norwich reminding him very much of when he was looking at the Brewers back in 2004 and and, and it got a similar right. kind of feeling and, and, and I think you know from what I know from reading articles and thinking about where Norwich stands and what it's done I, I happen to have a I don't, I've mentioned before, I don't know anything about the game, but I do know a little something about sports administration. And I think that the ownership at Norwich and the leadership, I happen to be a big fan of, of Stuart Weber from what I can see, what he's done. I think uh, Delia and her husband have done a great job as stewards of the club. I would think that he would be very comfortable with a relationship with those people and he would see a lot of similarities in terms of Norwich being, say, the cream of the crop in the second division, striving to gain entry and stay in the Premier League, and not that far away from it. Uh, and he would see, I think, 
you know, I think you enjoy the challenge of of beating the big guys. I think I would have loved watching that Man City match a few years ago. That uh, I think everyone thought, well, maybe maybe they're there to stay, and it you know might have been the highlight of the the recent history of the club. But uh, I, I think there's a, a I, I suspect that he's got a, a real good relationship with those people and feels that they, I think he also said in one of those interviews that, that, that he was impressed by some of the analytics or data analysis aspect of what Norwich is doing and sounded like he was interested in having, learning more about that and sharing it with his analytics people in, in Milwaukee. And, and he also mentioned uh, something about bringing people down to Tampa when the team was training there and meeting with people from Norwich, whether it was the front office people who traveled with the team or maybe you know, like in, in a streaming environment, you know, talking to the, the peer group, the people in say, who work in sponsorship or merchandise and so on. And, uh, and enter into what we we used to call in our meetings best practices, sharing what works, what didn't work, and helping each other out. It sounds to me like he's humble enough to understand that there are things he doesn't know or understand, and he's willing to learn, and he's not ashamed to admit he doesn't understand. And I think that's, if that's the case, I think that's that's an outstanding attribute for somebody in a position uh, where most of his peers don't act that way. And uh, so and I, he did mention also uh, that he, the, the Brewers, as most teams do, are very active in the international market. The international market, I think 80% of the players are American in Major League Baseball, 20% are not. Probably 19% of those at that 20% is either from the Dominican Republic or Venezuela. And because of the political situation in Venezuela, most of those young players, and you can sign these kids at 16, uh, wind up attend, uh, attending the academies that each team sets up, which is a combination of, of schoolhouse, uh, dormitory, cafeteria, and, and baseball fields, and where they get training. And after a couple of years, if they're good enough, they're invited to play in the States and try to join the teams in the States. But that's a very big market. And it's a very strange market to deal in. And it was uh, years, some years ago, they used to call it the Wild West in terms of signing people, hiding people out before their 16th birthday so other teams couldn't get a hold of them. And um, I always say that the Brewers would understand that game just as any other team would. And the relationship that Norwich has with what? Was a team in Brazil? Correct. It it's in yeah. Brazil, right? Yeah. I'm sure they could share some really interesting stories about what it's like to sign players, whether they're football players or they're baseball players, but they would also be able to maybe share contacts or share how to deal with it. And it is, it is a different world to, in, in terms of how you sign players down there. And, and I, I really like the idea that, that he was bringing some of his staff down to Tampa. And I think that's a, and that's, that's going to point to a, a pretty good relationship between the two teams. I think both teams are going to benefit from that relationship. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of, um, at this stage, the incremental to how he works and, and what he wants to do. As you say, it's it's maximising those marginal games, whether it's in sort of data analytics in terms of your player pool or maybe commercially. Um, you know, I don't think anybody now is under the illusion that... He's going to come in and, and, and just throw tens and tens of millions of dollars at Norwich City because that's not how he's operated with the Brewers, clearly. You know, he's just a very smart, astute operator. So just commercially, we've talked at length about the stadium footprint and, and what you can do there. You know, maybe not so much Brewer specific, but but in baseball, what, what sort of translatable areas do you think he might be looking at in terms of revenue and, and increase? Well, you have to separate what isn't translatable, such as local television and broadcast rights, that apparently isn't going to happen in, isn't going to improve in, 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 uh, in 
Norish, yeah. uh, and some other things, and look at what is it that he has done in Milwaukee and other teams have done in, around the States uh, that might work at Norwich. Now, it's very likely that most of these things have been thought through by the people in Norwich. I don't, I don't doubt for a minute that they haven't given a lot of this some thought. But for me, the, the order of importance would be looking to see about the feasibility of increasing atten uh, capacity at Carroll Road. Uh, I think a team that sells out 26,000 tickets or so each game could probably expand their capacity by five to 7,000. I don't know whether this, the structure can hold the building of a second deck on maybe half of the, whatever the section is between the goals, you know. And, uh, yeah. Think you stand, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, and and when and and whether if you could do that, you at the top of that include luxury suites. Now, I can't emphasize how valuable those suites are, even to a community the size of Norwich, and how much revenue is generated by the sale of those seats. At the same time, you might be able to create some group rooms where you could go out to church groups, school groups, businesses, and have them bring 50 of their customers or their employees or their students and have a day at the park and in addition to that you have and I, you know, where i'm at a disadvantage is i've never been to the facility i don't know for instance i don't know if there's any concessions sold inside carroll road at all whether there's whether there are stands built into the the facility or not or whether it's even whether there's any room for it where there's a feasibility to do that but that would be certainly something else I would look at, whether there could be some way to do that. Now, I understand the game itself precludes selling as much beer as or as they sell in Brewers Park. There's a name, you know, it used to be, I guess it was Miller's Park, but it was uh, Miller's is a, one of the beers that made Milwaukee famous. So, you know, beer drinking is a, uh, a sport in, in uh, American uh, stadiums. I don't even know if it's legal in, in, uh, in Britain, but uh, yeah. those types of revenues are pretty important. And if you can't do it inside, you play three o'clock in the afternoon. To me, you can have some form of fan fest or something outside the park. I assume there's some room available. It doesn't take much. We do it on a street. We shut down a street next to our park on occasions, mainly during the playoffs and have music, have maybe cook-offs, uh, food stands, uh, games for kids, uh, all kinds of things, uh, merchandise stands, the types of things that people would want to spend an hour or two before the game. And, and that's an area where you could sell concessions if you can't do it during the game. I mean, you're not going to, you have 45, 50 minutes, then you got a 15 minute break. You're not going to sell much in that 15 minutes, whether you have wonderful stands or not. It's just not going to happen. Uh, one thing, you know, in this day and age, I see it in our some of our luxury, luxury seating, is people ordering cons food and beverage by phone and having it delivered to their seats. I don't know if that's an option. Uh, just something, just brainstorming. These are the types of things that I would think of. And uh, pardon me when I look at some of my notes, because I, I've written a few things down. but. Uh, well, maybe we'll move on, but uh, in terms of, the, uh, can you, is there parking around them? Is there availability? Not, so much, uh, not, not that, I mean, there is limited, but I, th I think it is, it wouldn't be, I don't think it's opened up to supporters. Um, I'm just doing a sort of top of my head. I think, you, for example, if there's a, if there's a big live TV game, you have these huge, massive sure. trucks. Very take up a lot of space. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think that's open to them. But I mean, we, we've obviously you know been back and forth prior to you know having a conversation today, and I think I've explained to you about how they have bought up those parcels of land around the stadium footprint and the previous. Um, you yeah. know, but what what, what do you with, with, a, with a view to to doing that? With a view to as you as you rightly pointed out there, Dan. You know, could you turn it into a 
an experience rather than just traveling to Car Road to go and consume the game and then go home again? Could you get them there earlier and then offer entertainment around the, the footprint of the stadium? Yeah. Before and after a game, for that matter. I think most of your you know, games are played when it's daylight after the game and in, in the warmer, you know, the, the summer and the, and the fall. Uh, a three o'clock start would be perfect. You, you, open, you start at noon. You know, and they have a few hours of fun and games and eating and, you know, and getting people in the mood and, and singing songs or whatever and then moving in and, and watching the game. I don't think it costs an awful lot to put that together. I think you can make money. I, I think you, uh, I think you forget what word you used earlier, but we're not talking about incremental. millions of incremental. Is there, I mean, really, without... The opportunity uh, to have the, the media rights and the local rights, yeah. uh, and unfortunately, they don't. I'm not sure they got a fair share of the TV revenue as it is. I think that's kind of scan, almost scandalous. This is, but uh, it, we're used to, you know, a, a, a fair share distribution along all 30 teams when when major league baseball uh, gets its revenue so uh, those are the types of things that he would have un understood and i think he said at one point i knew what i was getting into and i think one of the things he knew what he was getting into is some of the revenue streams that that he relies on in milwaukee are not going to exist and so what else can he use and uh, let me just Well, here's one. Uh, naming rights. Uh, why why can't you sell as you know, for years it was Miller it was Miller's Park. Now I think it's American Family something or whatever that is. Who knows? Maybe that's an insurance company. I'm not sure yeah. what it is. But there are teams in England who have sold the right the naming rights to their stadium. Yeah. Uh, and look Obviously, the teams aren't proud. They don't have their names on the uniforms. They have sponsors. Air, they have an airlines, or they have a car on it, and every team does it. Now, you know, we we're used to having the names of the team and the names of the players, as you do on the on the uniform. But why not say a, a regional bank? Yeah. In the name of the bank at Carroll Road, and that would yeah. be yeah. the name. And, and they would, and the and the sponsor who wins the naming rights would be responsible for all the signage, all changing all the signage, all the napkins and everything else that has Carroll Road on it. They would have, the, they would pay all that. And they would pay a considerable amount of money to have their name in lights and mentioned during every telecast and broadcast. I mean, I mean every team, every, virtually every team in the United States, there's what, 120, four professional teams in the four main sports and, and I, I don't have no unfortunately i don't know how many are in the in the soccer league sports but almost all of those fields are named they could generate revenue from that and i don't see any reason except for some people who are traditionalists who feel like it would be sacrilegious to to change anything in the name of carroll road because it is a, a uh, you know, it's 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 a well-known facility throughout the country. Everybody knows what Carroll, who plays at Carroll Road in England, I'm sure. But they, they can make, you know, a lot of money by selling the naming rights, and I'm sure that it's on his list. Yeah, that's yeah, and and the precedent there is there's, there's a few clubs in England now who have gone down that route, so they wouldn't be the first by any stretch. But more broadly, Dan, you know, we touched on it again before we we recorded merchandise. I mean, how important is that? to MLB clubs in general. Oh, oh, massive, massive. Yeah. And I can tell you, you know, because of the playoff system, which doesn't exist in England, where we played in four rounds of the playoffs in the entire month of October into November, actually, for the first time ever we played, we played eight games in our facility in, uh, during each of the series. Uh, they sell so much merchandise, and, and oh, here's and she show you this cap. The cap that I wore and thirty thousand of my best friends wore at every game. 
of those eight, and they wear them all season long. Uh, they actually bring truckloads of merchandise in after midnight every night to fill the merchandise because the store gets wiped out of all its merchandise. You're talking millions of dollars in sales, of which it's licensed by Major League Baseball, and they you know, get a cut of it. And of course, the team itself gets a significant amount of revenue. Uh, and during the season, those stores are open to the, you know, there's an outdoor entrance that are open six, seven days a week, uh, even when there is no game being played. Uh, I look through the website, the you know, Canary website, and, and, you know, saw a lot of stuff on there, and I'm sure they sell a lot of it, but there are some things I, you know, that I know that sell, sells well in the States, I would think that could sell with some advertising, some maybe uh, use of the players to be out and about in the gear uh, that, that would go very well. I, it gets very cold at Carroll Road in the wintertime, and I didn't see any parkas with the canary emblem on it, for instance. I didn't see any parkas in their website. I don't know if they have any. You know, heavy winter coats, you know, uh, school letter jackets, what we used to, we used to call them, you, you got when you when you got a, you played enough in your sport in high school, you got one of these jackets. And those types of things are not cheap. They, but you know, you got a you got a month before what what six weeks before Christmas. There should be a lot of sales of all the merchandise. I don't know if there is or isn't. But my suspicion is that would be an area that could be shored up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, one other area, and I think you mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, is that there are 365 days in a year. There are, what, at most 25 to 30 matches that the, the first team plays. I don't know if any of the academy teams play at, at Carroll Road or they play somewhere else. But that leaves 9% of the days where the field is empty. There's a lot that can be done in terms of events where you could have an event almost every day of the year if you worked at it. When we opened our new ballpark, we started a new department of non-baseball events. There are three people assigned full-time to that. We have weddings. We have religious ceremonies. We have Christmas parties. Some of them on the field, some of them in our party rooms. As a new facility, we made sure we had plenty of those rooms. I, I know you have a, a restaurant. Does it, do you have a restaurant there? There's I don't know. Yeah. yeah, is that open uh, to the public every day, or could it be used for parties? Could it be used? There's, and is it used? And for all I know, some of this stuff is being done. But you can have clinics for for the foot for the kids who are playing football and have some of the players or former players and utilize the former players who are in the in the area to teach people you know what you teach kids about the game and then you could you know maybe have some con, you know some drinks for them and and uh, camp you know the kids go to camp I assume over there and they they can come to have have a day at Carroll Road and you know, you charge a certain amount of money and you charge, maybe you give them some giveaway items. Or, uh, the people in Milwaukee, guarantee you, have great experience on how to sell their park. They could have more than one event on a day. You can have a, an event during the day, an event during the night. Uh, if it's worth it while to turn the lights on, you can do something at night. You can invite some of the leagues to play their matches there and charge them a small fee, but at least the fact that you can stand on the ground and you're a fan who never had the opportunity to walk onto the pitch, that's an enormous emotional and psychological advantage that uh, we all utilize because it's something, I mean, you could see grown men cry when they step on our field sometimes because they never, they may, play, may have played all their, you know, in their younger days on, what we call sandlot fields, but to play, to walk on a major league field is 
is an emotional event for a lot of people. And you can play on that, you can use that, and you can, you can sell it to some degree. I mean, in some cases, you wouldn't sell it. You might want to bring in uh, a fundraiser for, say, a cancer society or something, and you charge people a few pounds to kick a ball into a net. And that money goes to the, the charity. You don't necessarily have to charge them anything. It's a goodwill type of thing. But the use of the facility, when you're not using it for 90% of the time, is automatic. You've got to figure out a way to get people to come to the park. And whether it's inside or outside, I don't think it would be very difficult to do. And I'm sure that the brewers have people who could help, assuming it's not being done now. And I don't know whether it is or not. But yeah, it, yeah. It's I'll, definitely something that should be uh, considered. Yeah, no, I, I think it's fair to say, Dan, that some of those elements they, they probably are doing, but it's just whether that could be accelerated with, as you say, coming from a, a different perspective from, from what they, they've, they've done with, with the brewers. But there's absolutely no doubt, yeah, I mean, there is a potential for that and they are doing some of those things, but maybe they could, as you say, accelerate it, but maybe to close, let's bring it full circle. Um, and again, we're dealing with hypotheticals, but my takeaway from that last round of interviews was that he, he was quite clear. We all know I, I mapped it out right at the start of this discussion that at the minute he's almost dipped his toe in the water and it's just uh, how he can develop his key relationships, as you rightly said, with, with the majority owners, maybe Stuart Weber, Zoe, Zoe Weber as well. But hypothetically, you know, he, he did say in those interviews that he would be would be open to deepening his involvement uh, further and taking it further. Now, from everything that you've seen from a distance with a degree of detachment about what he's done with the Brewers, what do you think that could mean for Norwich City? Because... The, the, I think the one thing that stands out for me is this isn't a guy who's gone into the Brewers and got bored 18 months down the track, two years, and then decided it's not for me and got and, and got out and gone in a different direction. You know, that longevity, I mean, you might tell me that that's that's pretty common in, in Major League Baseball ownership, but but it, it does smack of somebody who's willing to build something, um, the foundations in, and, 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 and look mid to longer term rather than looking at it as a short term maybe investment. So, what do you think? Well, not, my, my take on, on what he is doing is that he wanted to get involved in British football. He took a look around. He realized he didn't have the $7 billion that the Glazers are asking for Man U. I mean, don't get me started on that group. <laughs> but in any event, uh, so he looked around and said, where can I gain entry at a, mo at a modest investment. I mean, in his world, it's a modest, whatever the amount of money is, it's a modest investment compared to what he would have to pay if he got involved uh, like some other American owners of other sports have in the Premier League. He doesn't have that kind of money. As someone told me, he, he doesn't have Abramowitz money. But he's, you know, he's fairly wealthy by our standards. And I think he sees this as a an interesting opportunity because it's a club that has proven itself in the past to be very successful, very well run, with an opportunity to get involved with a team that could conceivably make it to the Premier League and stay there for a while. And then he could have an opportunity to beat the big boys, just like he did in baseball. And also, uh, if he decided that this was what he wanted to do, and, and I gather there's a path to possibly uh, having a, a majority share of the team at some point. I mean, he'd be where all these other people are who are paying an awful lot of more money. It's, it's, a, it's what I think a pretty reasonable investment in his part. And in worst case situation, if he felt he had to get out, he'd probably get his investment back plus some. But what, he, what can he do? I'm not sure what owners can do. I mean, you talk about the money that a lot of owners have and allegedly throw around. I'm not sure how accurate that really is. Uh, but you, you know, if, if, the, if there's a cash call and there's a player that you really want, I'm not talking, you know, Ronaldo or something like that, but a player that maybe the finances and maybe, maybe he could step in and, and pitch in and help out. 
And I suspect that's pretty much what's going to happen. I, I think he is, I think he's a competitive person. You have to be a competitive person to be in his, his main job world and also in, in baseball, in any sport. And I think he's going to take, take the challenge and he's going to consider it a challenge. It's, look, never met the guy. Don't know the first thing about him. This is just my sense of, of what I feel that he would want to do. And I think he made a very shrewd investment. He, he probably saw a lot of places that would have cost him a lot more money that didn't have the foundation that Dorich has. And I think it's a solid foundation. Whether or not the team will get promoted this year or next year or ever again, who knows? I think they have the, the players who could conceivably do it. But I think he feels it's worth the risk, and I think he's going to be all in on doing whatever he feels he can do to help. Uh, and I think he'll be very uh, supportive of the staff that they have, and maybe he'll bring some people in, but I think he'll understand that baseball is in football. And then while there are some transferable skills, maybe in the ticket office, maybe in the merchandise department, uh, maybe not in the football department, you know, in the, in, the, in the team development department. And I think he's smart enough to know that. And I think it's going to be interesting to watch. I, I don't think we're, any of us are in a position to, to say with any certainty what's going to happen. But I would say that the team will be successful enough for him to want to continue growing his share. And what happens after that, I don't know. I just don't know that he's going to – an owner itself is going to make that big of a difference because the the deck is stacked against the north cities of the world when it comes to playing in the Premier League. I think you, everybody understands that. Uh, and so unless the game is the rules of the game were changed and the top six or eight teams aren't the teams that ever that the, that the league wants to promote and not care about the other 10, 12 teams, unless that changes, then, then it's a tough climb. But it's a, I think it's a challenge that he would relish. Yeah. And I, I don't know, what, what do you think? I mean, what's, what's your sense of- oh, no, no. First time? no, no, nobody wants to hear what I think, Dan, that's for sure. Oh, come that. on. No, 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 well, I, think, I, I wouldn't disagree. Yeah, I think certainly the cards are stacked against Norwich, and that's been proven the last two times in the Premier League, yeah. but. Um, I think people do see what he's done on vis a vis some of those other massive MLB out, out, out posts to be very competitive, and, and they'd probably take that with Norwich, I'm sure. You know, that I, if, I think if, so. if they could be astute and, and maximize revenues in various areas and be good in terms of the football sporting side of the business, then who knows? I, I just think the last two times in the Premier League, they haven't been competitive enough. and that's been an understatement. So, so if you could bridge that divide, whether it's sufficient to get that longevity in the Premier League, but certainly doing it a slightly different way might give them a better fighting chance. And that's probably all you can hope for, I think. Well, and I, I think the international approach, and I understand there's some issue with Brexit about where, where you can get players to come. And I, I'm not sure I understand that. But there are, I, I think the sort of common interest in, South America and Latin America, the understanding of the value of recruiting there and maybe some other parts of the world where they can recruit. Uh, I, I think that my sense is that that's, that's where the future would lie. And I think that, uh, that he would be very interested in pursuing that part of the world uh, because he already has, and he's had some success with that. And realistically, if you, if you have the ability to sign players in a part of the world where maybe not all that many competitors have entered, and maybe that's the case right now, uh, maybe they will get fortunate signs. I mean, I think the two guys they signed this year have a real future. Now, hopefully they could, they will stay, which is another issue, you know, you know which is a tough part of, of the sport is you, you, you're in a position where you grow talent and then you have to sell it. And that's, that's not a real sustainable model to compete at the Premier League level. And I don't know how you get there. 
I mean, yeah. smarter people than I have wrestled with that, and I'm sure there a lot of them are sitting in the boardroom of, of a lot of teams in the championship right now. How do you survive against all odds? And uh, once again, I think it would be a challenge he would cherish, and hopefully he could pull it off. Hey, hey. Yeah, one thing's for certain, Dan. It, it certainly won't be dull, that's for sure. But um, it, suffice to say, thank you so much for your time today. Far, far too much of it being taken up, I do apologise. But tremendous insight into what he's done with the Brewers and, and what could translate and, and what that might mean for Norwich City. So, um, obviously, keep watching from across your side of the pond. And uh, Will do. Fingers crossed. Uh, but thanks for your time. Thank no you, Dan. problem. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Patty.